Nah. Nah. Is your asshole lich? <laughs> no. Hmm. Okay. Welcome to the I Regret Nothing Podcast. I Regret Nothing Podcast. Sweet. With Mike J and Pedro. I regret nothing. I regret nothing. We regret nothing. I regret everything. Everything I've ever done. We're back live, everyone. Uh, And look who it is. Look who we got here today. We have someone who actually means something to the world, not just three (laughs) jerk-offs from Running With Scissors. We have (laughs) the infamous Zach Ward. Uh, hey everybody, how you doing? Yeah, he is decided to grace our lowly shit podcast with yes. his presence. He's decided to elevate the quality of our crap. We are now uh, gold covered crap. So, uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy day, especially in the holiday season when you had a brand spanking new movie come out in the last couple of weeks. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, I did watch it the other night, and while I am a fan of Christmas Story, I do watch it every single year. As a Jew, I watch Christmas Story every year. Um, I have not seen any of those unofficial sequels, but I did watch this one, and uh, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. I enjoyed it, and uh, I was waiting for your cameo, and I was absolutely not surprised with how good it was. Thank you very much. It was very good. Um I don't know if anybody else here watching or or on the show has yes, had a chance. Uh, you got a chance to watch it. Yeah, it was it was I great. Had a chance. And uh, you know, as a as a movie watcher myself, obviously I've seen Zach in a lot of other things over the years, uh, namely Deadwood, because that was uh, one of the things I watched many many times. But uh, if you didn't know, he was in a little movie called Postal back in the day. Um, he played the Postal Dude. So for those that are like, who the fuck's Zach Ward? Well, this is the Postal Dude, bro. This is the film version of the Postal Dude. And uh, currently, the only place to watch that movie other than a DVD bought from our website or uh, Steam, which nobody watches movies on Steam, is currently Tubi. I don't even know what that is, but uh, Postal well, is... Well, that's good, actually, because it, it monetizes every time okay, uh, good. people watch it with the commercials, so you might make money. We won't, but... Uh... <laughs> Uva will. <laughs> our money, our money was already made, which was basically nothing. And any other money we would have made would have been on DVD sales because they were including the postal game with it. And um, I'm sure we'll get into this later. But when the theatrical run of the movie got completely shit canned, the DVD run of the movie also got shit canned. And oh, yeah. yeah, and and Best Buy and and Walmart and all them cut their orders down by a order of magnitude. And so the money that we were looking to get which was pretty large became infinitesimally smaller and yeah i had the experience with the titus show yeah that, you know i was gonna get to that as well that's obviously the first major thing i remembered you from when they announced you were playing the postal dude was titus because that was a show i and i know pedro is a huge fan of back in the day on fox and um yeah, I mean, ironically, uh, I'm going to be later on today. I'm doing an interview with Cracked Magazine. They're going to do an oral history of Titus. Nice. So one of the one of the reporters or one of the contributors to Cracked Magazine, um, can't remember his name off the top of my head, but um, they're doing a full piece on the Titus show because of how edgy and funny and fantastic it was. And that's like 20 years later, man. That's crazy. Yeah, that's it's one of the many shows that Fox has failed to uh, advance, despite it being so good. We'll just throw it on the list with, you know, Arrested Development, Firefly, a bunch of other things. Um, yeah. But one one of our questions, and we'll just move it up, was was from yeah. Pedro, and he was going to ask you how did it feel to do the Titus reunion stuff. Like, I mean, that's just talk about Titus for a minute because I realized that was like a, a big time in your life and. Yeah, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Christopher and I are still have been very good friends ever since. Um, when he came up with the idea to do that, uh, I thought it was awesome. Uh, we talked about uh, the story ideas, uh, the where the where the characters would be x amount of years later, <clears throat> how to incorporate uh, Stacy Keach 
into the project knowing that he's an older man and so certain things are difficult for him and it was during covid so you can't just have him exposed you know mm -hmm. um yeah it was a lot of fun there's something there's something about doing a live show performance like we did on the original Titus show. So we were, we would do it in front of a 500 person audience and, and we did it in real time. Meaning uh, if you're sitting in the audience, there'd be monitors up above you and then you face and the flashbacks play and then they go black. The, and, and the, the uh, stage is all blacked out. Like you can't see it. There's no lights. So you're sitting in the audience and there's big monitors above you and you're watching the show there and then it goes black there and then one two three the lights come up on the stage and then the scene starts that we're all in acting and so we do all that blah 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 and then cut stop we freeze the lights go down and then the monitor comes back up for you to see more neutral space and flashback the same way it was done when you watch the show at home so it was edited on the fly for the audience in the in the stage to have the same experience that you would at home, which is really cool. Um, so it, it was a really organic process with the audience. And, and at one point, I remember Chris Titus went on, um, uh, what's the guy, Baba Booey, Howard Stern. Stern. He went on Howard Stern, and Howard Stern was busting his balls for the laugh track. And uh, Chris was like, we don't have a laugh track, man. <laughs> We don't use one at all. We actually have to cut the laughs down. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was amazing to have that live energy with the audience. And it really is an educational process. The, the, the way you can relate to it, anybody can relate to this, is if you've ever been to the beach, everybody on this has been to a beach at one time in their life. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. All yeah. the time. Yeah. And, you, and you are wearing shorts or you've got, you've rolled your pants up and you walk into the water and it, it's coming up to about your knees. Right. And you can feel, you can feel the wave. You can feel the energy of the wave pushing. You can close your eyes and you can basically tell when the next wave is coming, right? You know that moment. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it feels like when you're doing live comedy. When you're doing live comedy, you feel the buildup of the momentum of the dialogue, the setup, and then the payoff. And right. then here comes that laugh. Yep. And then you have a reaction to someone says something funny. And then you've got a reaction like, what the fuck? And then the second laugh comes. And literally, it is exactly that same feeling. It's like a give and take and an ebb and flow with the audience. It was an amazing experience. Um, so when you get into that and you do that for three years, do 54 episodes, and you're working with someone, you get your comedy rhythm in. You know how to hear each other and play off of one another. And it's a lot of fun. It's like having a superpower, to be honest with you. Yeah. And uh for anybody out there, if you get the chance to be on the live audience sitcom uh, or do something where you're funny, it's the greatest experience with an audience because they they love you and, yeah. and you're making them happy. Um, so to answer your question, coming back to doing the reunion special that Christopher produced and wrote and directed uh, was great, was awesome, was a lot of fun. I also saw how fat I was, and that was good. Um <laughs> Yeah. I don't think you're fat, but oh, I'm not, I'm not now. But when I did that, <laughs> oh, I, had been, I had been a lot of this. Well. It was COVID uh, times, right? Everybody was sitting at home uh, baking bread and not working yeah. out and, and, and doing. So, yeah, that's uh, so that was what you see that on camera. And you're like, oh, my neck <laughs> was up to my ear. That's not good. Oh. <laughs> so, um, you didn't just yeah, try that like puffed up carrot top look. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's that's one of the many reasons why I quit drinking. But um yeah. it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun and it and uh I still to this day like I'll be seeing Chris on Christmas and um we enjoy each other's company immensely and uh, very easily and quickly fall into a rhythm of co comedic timing. Yeah, of that's, course. Uh, it's delicious. It's fun. Well, they say that, that awesome. like anybody, any, not any actor, but most actors can do drama. It's not hard. It's getting that comedic timing, especially with other people yeah. that, that is really hard to do. Even edited, it's hard to do, right? Like it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's impossible. Well, look, look at the movie Postal. There's so <laughs> many moments in that film where you go, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's not how that should be. Of course. Let's keep the editing. And right. they don't. So well, we'll, we'll save that for later. So the Christopher Titus stuff, <laughs> yeah. the fact that uh, Cracked Magazine is doing an interview with me later on today to That's talk awesome. about 
uh, is very exciting. And it's funny, uh, I'll give you a little taste, because Chris, I when I got the request, I, I called Chris right away to make sure that this was on the up and up. I don't know, you got to corroborate with your boy. Sure. And he was like, yeah, he talked to the guy and he starts making jokes like, yeah, and I was telling him how you were farting on set all the time. And uh, yeah, that happened. That happened. Um, I, what are you going to do? What are you gonna, I was into the protein shakes. As as Mike, you know, the protein shakes back in the day were, yeah. Were, yeah. Were, were nuclear on yeah. your stuff. Yeah. Lots of gas. Uh, got to go. You got to go. Lots of gas. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but I'm going to tell them a story about how I, how I farted to save a woman from humiliation. I, I threw myself on a fart grenade. <laughs> and uh, so I look forward to you guys all. In front of 500 yeah. live studio oh, audience people. Not so. only did I throw myself on a fart grenade, to, out of pure kindness, pure kindness. And when you read the story, you'll be like, what a great guy Zach is with that fart. <laughs> but not only did that have to happen in front of 500 people, bad enough, cut to a few years later, I see a thing on the television, Fox bloopers and practical jokes. <laughs> sure enough, the outtake of me on stage in front of 500 people farting is now making it into a program and i got a residual check off of that i was like that is the button <laughs> that's right yeah there. right that's the gift that keeps on giving yeah. that's a win-win for yeah everybody. i mean you didn't shit your scared. pants you didn't shit your pants on stage <laughs> I <shit> my <laughs> but uh, the world has witnessed me pass gas and paid me for it and i don't know if there's anything more entitled than that no i mean the the fart joke has been around for a long time and usually the fart joke isn't actually a real fart yeah but uh commitment this yeah, guy no that's that's <laughs> method that is method <laughs> acting friends he doesn't just yep. stick his ass out he actually saves one in the I, chamber I butt yell stella <laughs> right <laughs> stella uh well actually our, our our first question was gonna be was what was your favorite project and i mean obviously you have tons of tons of roles we, we were looking yeah. through your imdb but the way you talk about titus may that might have been your favorite project to work on it was and so i mean they're all very different you know yeah. uh, titus was an incredible learning experience in the first season um i was always very interested in the writing process and i would go up to the writers room and i sort of peek my head in and i'd listen to them pitching ideas and i'd try and throw something up out and they go hey zach how about you shut the fuck up and get out of the room yeah <laughs> I was like, okay, second season, I would be pitching an idea, and they'd be like, no, that's fucking horrible, but I'll tell you why. Nice. Okay. And then third season, I was, uh, I pitched some ideas, and they're like, ah, that's really good. And they put it in the show, and I was like, yes. Well, that's you know, you so, pay, you paid I mean, your dues with the writers. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I was learning to, and um, you know, I learned so much through that process. It was such a huge part of my life uh in in front of the camera and behind the camera with my own personal life and so forth going through divorces and everything yep um but making people laugh and making them connect with you and then you know with the character of dave it, what an amazing character to play because he's he's funny he's goofy he's a pothead and he's kind of a genius and he's yep. emotionally open like there was an episode we did called um tommy's not gay and a uh, great episode, brilliant, heartbreaking, hilarious episode. And I did this thing where, where David Chatra plays Tommy, his father come out of the closet and he's freaking out. He's like, does that mean I'm going to be gay? And I were in a bar and I drink some beer and I, I go here, hold this. And I turn around, and I grab him and I kiss him and I kiss him, I kiss him and I push him down on top of a pool table and his leg is pounding and I'm kissing him, kissing him, kissing him. We're going, Mwah! like that he goes no i'm like then you're not gay there's two other things i can try he's like no no, no. <laughs> and you are now <laughs> so i think that a couple of, i think that was season two and in season three what we noticed is that i ended up having this huge fan club uh like i felt like a beetle at certain moments it was crazy there were all these teenagers and they were um with signs, we love you, Dave, and all this stuff. And what I noticed, and remember, this is 20 years ago, 20, yeah. Yeah, 23 years ago, um, there was a lot of LGBTQ kids out there. Yeah. And what I loved about that is in my backstory, I grew up, my mom's an actress. I grew up backstage uh, around theater people. There was a, a gentleman by the name of Doug Grass uh, who raised me for a few years. He was like a, he was like a, an, an auntie 
to me, a big gay man who was uh, I loved dearly. And later on in life, he was beaten to death with a ball peen hammer. Um, horrific. So I was exposed to a world of people who were disenfranchised and fearful. Yeah. And yet I got to know them as people as I was a kid. And they're lovely, sweet, kind people. And some of them are assholes, just like everybody else. Sure. But what was interesting is how this fan club sort of crossed the spectrum of like the teenage girls. Oh, yay. And then also teenage boys who with long hair who are seeming a little crossing the lines of what their identity is but they're feeling connected to Dave because Dave didn't give a fuck as long as you were a good person. And I thought that was awesome. That was really cool to have that connection. So it was a, it was an awesome character to play and so well-rounded in a very honest way. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And that, um, that actually ties pretty closely into, into postal itself. I mean, like our fan community really does span the spectrum. I mean, obviously we've got, a lot of, you know, hardcore gun nuts that just want to go into games and shoot whatever. And then we have, like, a pretty large LGBT community. We have furry community. I mean, we've got, you know, a uh, Vor community out there, too. So, I mean... I don't know what that is. Well, Pedro can explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> he seems to love it and <laughs> likes to comment on it a lot. Pedro, give him a rundown of what Vor art is. I've seen a little bit of everything, but uh, can we imagine a creature eating a human and having a big belly and you see the inside of the belly in that drawing. Yeah, that's war. And uh, some people get up to that and they love it. Um, <laughs> yeah. And they've drawn some postal war art too. And we're like, cool. It's great. I've seen, but you know, it's whatever, whatever you want, true horror. whatever, whatever <laughs> you like. That's cool too. Um, oh yeah. No, no, no. If, it, <laughs> if somebody is saying that I will war cat Dennings, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's Probably. That's, yeah. uh, that's I don't Pedro. Know how... Just so you know, a little back history. Pedro's favorite actress, that's his celeb crush, is Kat Dennings. So, okay. Um, it's, it comes up every episode. Um, he thinks she's the best. And he watches. It's almost like a He watches joke, Two Broke Girls every day just so he can get wow. a little bit more Kat Dennings I, in his actually, life. Actually, uh... I, have a, I was on the last track of uh, Two Broke Girls uh, when I was living in West Hollywood. Uh, I was visiting the Warner Brothers lot, and uh, they had us, hey, you guys want to do the last track for Two Broke Girls? <laughs> and it was not funny, and I couldn't laugh. <laughs> so I was, like, very forced. And well, I'm sure sometimes it laugh. would be funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, laugh track no, but they had, yeah, but laugh tracks yeah, this, always feel yeah, the, forced. That's the problem. We were, like, maybe 50 or 60 people. Uh, it was not that packed, but they had the monitor above us, and they are like, three, two, one, and then, like, laugh. And then... Uh, I mean, people were laughing, but I, w I was like, I, I can't. It was not funny. <laughs> but I mean, it was cool. It was a really cool experience. But I was like, all I gotta it say fun. is just, just a callback. We didn't have a laugh track. No, just no. Just saying that's because it was actually. It and makes, at the beginning, it said, "This show way. is filmed before a live studio audience." Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So that was Titus. But you know, the reality is, there's just so many different projects I've been on, and they diff have different experiences. Um. And they're different challenges depending upon they're not always fun, but sometimes they're a great learning experience. Yeah. And that's it, it. When you look back at your, I guess when you look forward at your life, you sort of make it much simpler. It's like good or bad. When you look back at your life, the quote bad things you learn from and they affected how you make decisions and the good things might've ended up not having a long impact. So right. is it good or bad? Um, I think the the process that I go through now with every project is once I decide to accept a role, sometimes I get paid very well, sometimes I don't. And uh, But once that threshold is crossed, it doesn't matter what I'm getting paid. I, I want to do the best job I can. And I don't really give a fuck about the rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. Unless I'm starring in it or directing it, uh, that's not my problem. My my focus is on what I'm doing and what I'm yeah. bringing to the team. Of course. And as long as I can match the caliber and style of my performance with what the style of movie is supposed to be so that they sync well, then I'm going to do my best to knock it out of the park in whatever texture that is. I also know that once I finish shooting the AL cut, well, uh, did the AC get in focus? Was the camera move good or was there a bump? 
how's the editor going to cover this? What's the sound? Do they yeah. get it? Do I have to ADR that? Uh, are they going to color correct this properly? What's the score that goes underneath it? What's the sound design that goes underneath yeah. it? Um, what's the setup to this? So many things that I'm not in charge of no. that I literally have to go, whatever, I'm out. But I, once I've committed to the process, then I do it as if I was working for Scorsese yeah. because, you know, who knows when I'm going to die and that'll be the last thing I do. When in your career did that change, right? Like you... I'm sure I'm assuming you just started acting and then eventually you got more into the production side of things. So at a certain point in your career, your mind shifted from, you know, you're showing up for a job to like, I wonder how this sounded and that sounded like, instead of just like cut, you're out. Right. Like that's probably how your acting career started. You just, you did your part and you, yeah. and you well, bolted. Yeah. When you're younger, you don't really know all the pieces that, uh, that come together. I'll be honestly, Uvo was a big part of that. Uh, Uba was a huge inspiration to me um, to make films because how to say this nicely because um, he runs involved, the he runs the movie Make a Wish Foundation and he he was one of those kids that got his wish made. No, I mean, you know, if you've never made a movie, you don't know what goes into it. Oh, it's but, fucking hard. <laughs> it's hard. But I also know what could have gone into it and didn't. Yeah. And so I, I came up with a saying, and you guys out there in the world can steal this by all means, but this is mine. Uh, great movies are inspirational. Bad movies are motivational. When you see a movie that's not good or a performance that's not good or a video game that's crappy or a piece of art that you think is shit, you have options. You can say it's a piece of crap, but it also challenges you, can you do better? And at a certain point, sometimes you get angry enough where you're like, fuck this. This is garbage. I could do better than that. Well, go do it. Because you will soon learn it's a lot more complex than you knew. But through that process, your learning curve will go like this. You'll suck, 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 and then you keep on fighting, and then you'll come back out, and then you'll see where you stand. And you may not be better than the guy that you thought you were going to be better than, but at least you've learned something with your life. Um, that was kind of the motivation like the, that Uva gave me, that I was there in every single scene and, and I had issues with them. When I got to see it in the edit, uh, because they had sent me over the, what they said was a rough copy, but it ended up being the final version of the movie. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it really did inspire me to be like, look, it, I could do better. I would make different choices. I would yep. make different choices than he would. And in my mind, those dis, those choices would be better and funnier and, and would make a better movie in my point of view. Um, you know, editing and comedy are very much like dance. It's interpretive. It's, it's very, sure. very simple. Um, so that was where he inspired me and motivated me because when I saw a postal, I thought it would be one thing and it would became another. And although there are some great moments in the film, uh, I felt like the potential of it was much higher than what was delivered. And being there, I saw places where the ball was just dropped. And, and again, I, I was younger then and I didn't know everything that he was dealing with, but I would have made different choices. So out of my arrogance, um, which is a great place to start, my arrogance and ignorance, but also my tenacity to go, fuck it, I'm going to get into this. So I did. Um, and I've just finished, I'm finishing off my uh, fourth feature I've produced and the second one I've directed. And uh, that's Patsy Lee and the Keepers of the Five Kingdoms with James Hong and George Takei and Getty Watanabe and Bai Ling and Matt Sato and Anna Har and Michelle Mao. And that's like uh, the Goonies meets Big Trouble in Little China with a little bit of Dark Crystal and Labyrinth. Nice. So, um, yeah. So it's, yeah. That that was the motivation. If great well, movies are <laughs> motiv inspirational, and bad movies are motivational. Well, unfortunately, Postal is also one of his best pictures. So it's like yeah. this weird thing yeah. where you know the <laughs> the crap rose to the top, right? Like he has had some relatively decent serious films after Postal. But um, Postal at the time was definitely his best movie by far. And yeah. we all know that it could have been light years better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It, that's not, I mean, there is a, a hardcore cult following to it within our community too. Like 
Our community does not hate that movie, and I don't hate that movie either. I think it actually isn't the worst thing ever. It just needed some work. It needed polish. Yeah. It needed another. It needed. I would say, to very honestly, I think it needed another pass in the yeah. edit from somebody else, probably. Yeah. 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 From a from a professional comedy right. editor. Right. It like George the- Lucas doesn't edit his own work the best. Somebody else does. When he edits yeah. it, it's not great. So. And, and that's the point. Is it, it needed one and a half more passes and that i think it could have been yeah. much tighter much sexier much funnier really leveled up the jokes uh and really paid off better i Definitely. wasn't i wasn't on set long enough to see but the stories i was told back then where he also didn't do enough takes of scenes so in the editing room he didn't have enough options and it's because <laughs> the story that i was told was that it was jason statham that got him to stop doing so many takes and to remove <laughs> on set takes or you know because he was like no no we don't have time for this just film it and go film it and go film it and go so like i mean i'm not in the movie industry i just know that for the most you part know, and it's, it's so long ago for me i don't remember yeah and it's the only f- movie we have so it's the only thing i remember yeah. so and and i have to talk about it a lot because we get asked a lot i mean like when i do tiktoks the questions i get range but there are always a lot of what do you think of the postal movie? Tell me stories about the postal movie. You know, lo- lots of right. that stuff. So it's something that, you know, I talk about a lot. So, yeah, it's a it's definitely a distant memory for a guy who's been in so many things. Um, but it obviously is our only film and uh, most of the reason why people want to see you here today. So <laughs> if we're talking about it too much, tell us to shut up. No problem. Um, but that is actually really cool to hear that Uva inspired you in in ways to, to sort of yeah. to, to just do it to do it yourself and, and, and necessity is the mother of invention when uh when i got i was in vancouver doing blood rain deliverance right after postal and uh my father was there in december he was there for his birthday i brought him out nice and um they brought over the dvd of what they said was the rough cut and i, I watched it and i literally turned green and uh, I, I thought I was going to throw up. Yeah. And um, I asked them, I asked Uva and the producer, I said, can I give some notes on this as the star of the film? And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so back in the day, this is 2006, you know, your laptop wasn't an editing bay. No. So I basically I had to hire a guy who had an editing bay. It cost me about 1500 bucks. And for which now I can do myself, which is hilarious. Yeah, right, of course. Uh, and then I I took the original the 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 DVD of the rough cut uh, cut, and I used that footage to try and chop it up and show the timing that jokes should have been in and right. the pace they should have been. And then I had like fourteen pages of notes with time code on it, and uh, sent it to everybody, and they never responded. Yeah. And the film that I got as the rough cut was the final movie and i mean it wasn't even color corrected guys <laughs> we you know look at that movie, <laughs> you look at that movie and it's not color corrected properly no when they go on the airplane and the terrorists are inside the plane that looks like it's in log c yeah. i mean it's all flat it has no contrast yeah. uh, the color values are crap it's it, also it, the best cut scene in the film like timing wise and what's crazy is when they fly the plane into the building the comedy timing on that is brilliant and that little shot looks like he's in front uh, on a big building the lighting is great the color saturation is great that's awesome and everything else looks yeah undersaturated like like so when you film on a on a professional digital camera and actually i think that was 2006 so that would have been 35 mil dude yeah would have been 35 mil bro yeah so you're getting a you're getting a lot of gamma you're getting a lot of range latitude in your f-stops there's no excuse for not color correcting that properly no and what i saw as the rough cut was what was delivered into theaters and that to me is just lazy and, yeah. and that's the problem with it you know yeah. and that's yeah that's what, that's what bothered me i saw there was a level of um okay we're done yeah. moving on 
Well, okay. we've always wanted to see the Ward cut, and I know you don't have it laying around, but if it ever popped up, I'd be happy to put that on Steam. Well, we can't put it on Steam uh, anymore. Trust me, you but. and I both know that uh, what I'd like to be doing is <laughs> making another Postal movie or yeah. a Postal TV series. And of I've course. Been, oh, yeah. That, uh, slapping some ideas around. It's taken a hind seat because COVID fucked the world. Uh, my business partner and I opened up a studio in 2019. November of 2019, and we had 10 movies set up, yeah. and we had a bunch of movies of the week, and oh, we were good, we were gold, we were done. Boom. And we had to just stop from going bankrupt, uh, and then we pivoted from, uh, we started getting into um, Unreal Engine technology and the LED wall tech that they yep. use on the Mandalorian. Uh, the volume. Business. Yeah, well, you can. The volume is multiple things. So in a video game, it's a big room with a lot of cameras pointing at you. Yeah. In the Mandalorian world, it's an LED uh, wall uh, that has got uh, you've got motion trackers on the camera. So as the camera moves around, the background environment on the LED wall pivots, yep. like with it's a game engine yep. in real time as the parallax shifts. So my business partner, um, Ace Underhill, and yes, that is his real name. Um, <laughs> he is he is a fleshy headed mutant. He was a partner level programmer by the age of 19 at Microsoft. So he was able to reverse engineer a lot of the proceeds from the Mandalorian so that we could do it on a, a much lower budget. Uh, our studio's name is Brilliant Screen Studios. You can go to brilliantscreen.com. And uh, we're a full production facility with uh, all the trucks and the, we got 15 cop cars and ambulances and three different stages and LED walls and Unreal Engine and blah, 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 all the crap. So if you're a movie 8 million and under, we can do it ourselves. Um, and that's where we now were able to get up to there because of COVID and all the problems. And now we're finally hitting our speed again. And with my movie finishing off, Patsy Lee, uh, which I'm very proud of, and it looks fucking great. Where are people uh, going to be able to watch that, by the way? Let's tell them where to watch it. So they can't anywhere right now. That, okay. that was done. It's a spec film, which means it was not made with distribution. We're okay. looking at doing a cast and crew screening, what I call a soft premiere, um, in February, which will actually be James Hong's 94th birthday. That's awesome. He just got his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame this summer, and he's got more credits on IMDb than any other human being in history. And uh, he's a he's a legend, dude. He, yeah. was in, he was in Big Trouble in China. He was in Blade Runner. He's a legend. Uh, he was everything, in, everywhere, all at once. Come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was also in Chinatown, bro. Yep. Um, yep. He's in everything. So, uh, yeah, that's we're doing that then, and then we'll be selling the film. But um, Okay. So, really, Postal as a movie or a TV series is something I would very much like to do. Yeah, and just so people know, he's not bullshitting. We've literally been talking about this for a decade. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's not something that we don't want to do. It's not something that we haven't explored. It just hasn't happened, and uh, yeah. it's going to happen. We, we get we get asked about it, like, every day for years. Yeah, yeah. Every day. Every day. Yeah, yeah every day. It's... Well, I mean, you should know that uh, the original Christmas story was in development for 10 years. Yep. Damn. Yeah. Yep. yep. Oh, I didn't even know that. Maybe at one point we put together a fundraiser on the uh, for a postal film yeah. uh, on your platform and keep. Uh, no offense to Uva, but no. he's a, he's there, not in the yeah. industry anymore. So I mean, right. So if I'm going to do it, then I'm going to do it. I'm yeah. not. I'm I'm too old and too experienced to be like here. Someone else. Here's my life. Please, <laughs> right. please don't fuck me over. Yeah. yeah Thanks yeah, so no. much. <laughs> no, I'm just. You know, maybe you will like it. Maybe you will like the movie. So. Yeah, <laughs> but but it doesn't matter if he does or doesn't. So. Yeah, he yeah, doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> what matters is that in the, at the end of the day, for us, and this is kind of how we are with gaming too. We don't make the best games. In fact, we <clears throat> trademark the worst game ever because that's where we live. But um, <clears throat> we like to make shit that we laugh at, and and if people yeah. laugh along with us, then fuck it, that's yeah. great too. And if they don't, then fuck them. So um, you hope you can make money, and you hope that you can keep doing it, and and eat. But, uh, you know, you make what you want to make and you hope that you can keep funding it along the way. So, I mean, even people sometimes who shit on the game, we are like, well, make your own postal game. We'll, we'll look we'll like, show us. And yeah. then they give up like, they give up like two months later. They're like, oh, yeah, right. it's not yeah. that easy. No, yeah. it's not, not easy at all. Months. It's not easy at all. Not and and with months. gaming, 
which it, it just keeps getting harder and harder because yeah. the, the level of, of development that is required now to make even remotely close to a triple A looking game is infinitely Dude. larger than Dude. it was 15 yeah. years ago. If you so. look at the video games I've done, like uh, army of two, the devil's cartel, that was a low budget game for EA. I think it was yep. not EA. It's, uh, was it EA or who was it? It was, uh, I, th I think it was EA. Yeah. And that was like a $50 million game. Yeah. And that was, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, right. and then I did Tomb Raider, and that was like a eighty million dollar game. Yeah, well, you know, GTA Five cost three hundred and forty million dollars, but it has grossed over eight billion dollars. Right. One game yeah. right. <laughs> in ten years. One game. Um, yeah, so I, I know yeah. uh, for GTA Six uh, Take Two, they gave uh, they gave them a max spending of one billion, but they can spend it the way they want. Yeah, on the game. So <laughs> That's... yeah. That's insane. Oh, if only, yeah. if only we had that budget, huh? Well, that <laughs> yes. game's going to be out for 20 years. You know, it's going to be, it's going to come out yeah. and it's going to be their only game for 20 years because, you know, that's what well, they Even do. now, uh, big games turn into TV shows. Like we have uh, Last of Us next month. Now Amazon is going to start doing God of War. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, this popping up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's funny is when we did Postal, you know, we, we had turned down Uva originally. We got some emails and we were like, no, no, no. I don't, we don't want to work with this guy. And, uh, me and Vince eventually had a conversation about this and we're like, there really isn't that many video games that get made into movies back then. Mm -hmm. So we were like, yeah. let's be one of 10 or whatever the number was at the yeah. time. Let's do this. And also we so, make crappy and, games. So and, and also, also like, let's be honest. I don't know the last video game that got turned into a movie that was comedy. Uh, Sonic is kind of funny, so, Sonic, but the game yeah, is bit. not funny. I mean Mario. They have Mario next year, but it's not really comedy. Yeah, yeah but it's well, not, it's not okay. the same kind. So it's not a funny Sonic, game. The video game. Right. The video game is not funny. No, it's not funny. No. Uh, yeah. Mario, the video game, it's not really funny. It can, yeah, it can be, but yeah, yeah, it's not. It doesn't yeah. mean to be. It doesn't. No. Yeah, Sonic, yeah, the video game does not have a sense of humor. No. It, it it has a sense of cuteness, but yeah. you, it does. You don't laugh out loud at something. No, no. Uh, Mario yeah. Brothers cuteness. It's if you like Hello Kitty, you'll get along fine with Mario Brothers, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like there was a point of view of, of a sense of humor from the game itself. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying is like, I don't see any other one that's really done that. I may be wrong, but. No, the other funny games, there's no funny game films. I mean, I guess no. is, uh, is Uncharted funny? I don't think so. That movie sucks. No ass yeah that movie yeah <laughs> it's so fucking bad dude well, and yes. watching mark Wahlberg, like hey how's it going over there you find you find some diamonds what's going on you, you find the treasure yeah, just like no effort at all dude just the most no. ridiculous bad cgi yeah. and, and so much yeah. money to make something so fucking bad yeah well, Assassin's Creed was me, the uh, same uh, way. Well, Assassin's Creed yeah, was oh horrible God. too. Halo, Halo sucked. Ha the show Halo well, also, was terrible. Uh, what What made me sad about the Uncharted movies that uh, Nathan Fillion? He looks exactly like the character. The guy who does the voice looks like Nathan Drake. Like they even did a short movie where he was playing uh, Nathan Drake. And well, he's like, also a Nathan? massive Uncharted fan. So yeah. So yeah. why did they not use him? They fucked him? up big yeah. time. <clears throat> they fucked yeah. up big time. He was down and to do the movie. Him. Yeah. yeah while with postal we can do the postal cinematic universe and properly cast everybody with a lower budget i think yeah <laughs> yeah yeah we need we do need to do we do need to do something else there's just too many of these projects but but there is some stuff that's looking good right like the last of us does look good uh yeah. it looks great yeah it does. It yeah. does. It and does. it's made by the guy who did uh chernobyl and chernobyl, chernobyl was great so i have faith yeah oh, and what's the his cast name? Is... i can't think of his name but he's very good he also hosted the podcast for chernobyl which uh Wow, this is awesome too. Yeah. Um, Martin something, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah it's good yeah. stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, oh yeah, uh, Pedro wants to know since it's part of our uh, screen here, and he's a sick fuck. Are you part of the foreskin or the no foreskin society? Uh, I'm not really getting <laughs> into those questions because it's stupid. It is. It <laughs> is. It's just you know, Pedro's a sick fuck, and I don't. I don't know what what he wants to do. Uh, we had a bunch of fans asking about Resident Evil 2, if you wanted to talk about doing Resident sure. Evil 2 at all. For sure. You know, they're they're huge fans of that as well, and you were in that, so. Ask away. 
That's the question. Talk about Resident Evil 2. They didn't have specific questions. They wanted to hear Zach wax about Resident Evil 2. You know what that reminds me of? Is like, remember when Chris Farley would do those interviews and be like, see, you were you were in the movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what, was, what was that like? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Well, okay. that's what our podcast is based on. It's on bullshit questions uh, with no real. So my my favorite part of doing that film, uh, there were a couple of things. I was training all the time with uh, with uh, military trainers to to really do the uh, CQB close quarters combat um, type of stuff, and uh, they were uh, Russian spaznots. So they're like Russian special forces and they were brutal and they were mean and they would wrap a baseball bat with uh, foam. And then I would have to go through this little improvised kill house made out of like, um, you know, those wrestling mats that Velcro together inside a dojo and then they kind of fold and you can put them up on the edge and, and you can kind of make a, a, like a corridor out of them if you wanted. So I'd have to go through that and I'd have different targets and I'd have a, a bull pup, which is a, so a bull pup is like a SMG small machine gun. Mm-hmm. That's got the magazine behind the trigger as opposed to out here, like a M14. Yeah, any, any yeah. counter-strike player knows this, this gun pretty well. So, okay. So yeah, we should all know this. So I have a, I have a bull pup Tavor, the original Tavor, uh, which was not a great weapon. And then I have a sidearm, which is a, a 40 ACP a Parabellum. Big ass heavy gun, but can actually shoot underwater, which is dope. So I'm going around this kill house and I have to go, brap, brap, and I'm doing all my pieing off and I'm hitting it. And then they would make little breaks in the, in the corridor where they would sneak in and like whack the gun out of my hand with a baseball bat raised <laughs> wrapped in foam rubber and I would have to go down to the ground roll come back out with my other sidearm up pap 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 drop the clip put it back in and then scan around and take shots and they were assholes about it but it was awesome it was so cool um and in the movie when I you first see us we're coming down this we're coming down this alleyway me Oded Fair and this other dude so there's three of us blah 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 and then um then a cop car comes behind us and we sort of duck out of the way and it goes through the alleyway and then we follow it. And then I turn and I'm shooting like this and there's like 300 extras in zombie outfits in the small town of Hamilton, Ontario. And it's a downtown Hamilton area. And then I, I, I shoot, bang, 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 bang. I pull out a grenade, I throw a grenade And then the camera goes off of me to all this mayhem. And what was amazing is literally that all happened in real time. So from us coming down, this is a one -er, a one shot. Yep. Going down the alleyway, the car comes by, we got to jump out of the way. We come around, shooty, shoot, shoot. I'm I'm running full load uh, blanks in my gun, which means if you put your hand in front of it, it'll blow a hole through your hand. Like you're still dealing with, near lethal force okay sure. yeah, yeah. And i've got a camera i've got cameras on steady cams coming around me i'm like all tough ass like do 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 shoot 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 throw a grenade and camera goes off of me and what you see are hundreds of people in zombie costumes there's speed ropes that are uh, supported above out of frame uh, with the lights above them and people coming down on ropes and opening up with these street sweeper 60 cows and just fucking mayhem and for me, so here's what my face looks like when I'm shooting it. I'm all, mm, hold on. I'm badass. Here I am. I'm, I'm badass. Ugh. Bang, 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 bang. Cuh, cuh, cuh. Throw the grenade. Camera goes off at me. Holy <laughs> fuck. Dude. Like it was like being in the world's greatest video game. Yeah. It was insane. It was <laughs> so like great cool. fun. Jesus. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It here's the thing is that one shot was probably a million five like it yeah. was it was one of those things you're like look what i get we've to got do. one take everyone this is real acid real acid everyone yeah it was it was awesome it was yeah. fantastic and like you get one shot for the final like how much prep goes into that is it like a month or three months for one oh, shot I'm, I'm sure you know i i don't know because they don't include me in all that stuff uh but i'm sure there's 
at least I'm sure months of prep going in months and months of prep going into that movie, probably a year dude with all the costumes, the guy who plays the uh, nemesis, right? That guy was six foot eight. <laughs> he was a uh, uh, six foot eight, 380 pounds in the scene. He's in a police station and he whips out a Vulcan, which is a mini uh, Gatling gun, right? Like the one they have on the side of helicopters. Yeah. And uh, it's chromed because that looks awesome. Of course. Um, and he fires it with one hand. And he is the first person in the history of cinema to ever fire a Vulcan minigun one-handed. <laughs> and uh, the director, they're like, yeah, we'll let it run for about you know a minute. And the armor is like, uh, how, how long? <laughs> what did you do? He's like, yeah, we'll let it run for like a minute. He's like, okay. Um, uh, they're 50 caliber blanks. Like, yeah, go in. Each one costs about two dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> yeah. And in a minute, it goes through about six thousand rounds. Yeah, you want in. <laughs> so you should know this, right? He's like, Oh, oh, he goes, I think that think that's overkill. And no yeah. one fires a Gatling gun on full auto for a no. minute. It's yeah, it's probably fifteen seconds. Probably fifteen yeah. seconds. Three seconds, bro. <laughs> yeah. Brr, brr, brr. I'm just saying it would run out in fifteen seconds. Yeah. It would be out. So um yeah, so he ended up, you know, running it for like eight seconds or whatever it was. But this giant of a man, giant of a man, wearing all this prosthetic latex appliance and fuckery, and giant, and he pulls the trigger, and you see his whole body slowly gets pushed backwards from the force of that gun. Yeah. And you'll see in the film, he's in a corridor, and there's all these little uh, bulletins uh, stapled to the wall, and the gun does this; it spins, it goes. Right, yeah, and uh, it creates a vortex and it ripped all the paper off the wall and spun <laughs> it in a circle. And none of that was pre special effects, that all happened, yeah, and uh, yeah, it all happened. They had no idea it was gonna occur. And then the camera, so here's the guy shooting, the camera's on a dolly, and they're moving the dolly towards him as he shoots. And they have a big plexiglass shield in front of the camera. And they had to get extra dolly grips to push the dolly because the force coming out of the gun yeah. was pushing the 400 pound dolly <laughs> back. Yeah. That's and, and dude, equals I MC was, squared, man. I was outside the building about a, probably a quarter of a block away and I was eating a sandwich and they pulled the trigger and it sounds like, an explosion i literally hit the ground so fucking fast <laughs> like oh my god uh, oh what the hell like just terrifying terrifying yeah, it was awesome that's, uh... see that's a great story from resident evil 2 yeah. why didn't somebody ask him about the fucking gatling gun scene why couldn't we have a specific question <laughs> uh, here's a cool one from uh, right, resident evil apocalypse uh in the scene where i kill the dogs right the scene where i kill the dogs boom 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 I've got this bitch. Cuh, cuh, stay, right? Uh, I wrote that line, stay, because yeah. it was a cool line. Sure. And uh, even cooler than that is uh, where that takes place is my high school, Northern Secondary High School, where I have <laughs> never been invited to a, a school reunion ever. <laughs> Yet I got to go shoot an $80 million movie and shoot up the cafeteria. I was like, that's right. Well, that's know. right that's all yeah. that, i mean that is the reunion you needed i i'm guessing so yeah yeah high school reunions suck anyway so shooting up your cafeteria sounds like a a <laughs> yeah, much more, a fun more fun reunion so yeah uh we had a few people ask what are the zach ward christmas traditions or they like to say the scott fargus tr christmas traditions do you have any specific christmas traditions i i do um my Christmas tradition has been raising money for different charities from Thanksgiving through Christmas. And my father uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2020. Uh, anybody who understands Alzheimer's or dementia, it's life crushing. Yeah. Um, I started working with the Alzheimer's Association because they were helping me out massively. If anybody's dealing with it, please contact them right away. They're free. They got local chapters. They can help you financially, medically, psychologically, uh, physically, help you have the support you need because there is so much collateral damage to this fucked heart of a disease. Yeah. Um, 
So I just got home on Monday from being uh, in Ohio doing the fundraiser at the Christmas Story House. And now it's just, to be honest with you, I just want to chill out, not talk to anybody, and hang out with my wife and just clean stuff up and slowly, day by day, organize my life. So when the world turns back on again, I'm not digging through shit to find what I need. Yeah. So I just, I need this time to recharge um, and just get over it, to be honest. Yeah, of course. There's, uh, yeah, my, there's my a grandma, uh, my grandma passed from Alzheimer like in September. So yeah, it's no joke. And it goes, it can go really fast. Like if within six months, it's, it, it's done. Yeah. So it, it's crazy once you, and, and I don't know if you recognize this, but like my father's only 22 years older than me. Hey honey, my father's only 22 years older than me. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when his die, like I was there when he did the test, the co the cognition test and it broke my fucking heart. Yeah. And once you get that diagnosis that that's what it is, you start remembering times maybe when you were with your grandma and they said something or they did something. You're like, what? Well, that's weird. Oh, grandma, you're being quirky. Yeah. You're being a little odd. And then in retrospect, when you look at it, you're like, that's when the brain was not firing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's brutal, dude. I would like to murder it. Uh, so yeah. That's what I do. I hang out with my wife and uh, I try to do as little as possible while as much as possible around the house so we can get into the new year and just be happy and relaxed. Yeah. You, well, you bust your ass all year and uh, need some time off. And I really fucking do, dude. I really yeah. do. Yeah. I know. As a guy that tries to reach out to you pretty relatively often about things, I am actually, I'm not, I'm not blown away. I, I expect it, but you do, you do really, really bust your ass and that's mad respect. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, and, and like I said to everybody earlier, like, we have been talking about a project for a long time, and it's not like we just text about bullshit. Like, no. we've actually discussed pretty high-level stuff for a long time. It just never materialized yet, and, and for a lot of different we've, we've reasons. Done, we've done contracts. We've yeah. gotten into story development, and, yep. the, and the reality is um, it's it's not worth crapping out no. just to get it done. no. Uh, because it's too much work yeah and it's it's like there's got to be the money and there's got to be the distribution portal of course. and now there's more opportunities like you were talking about Tubi. yep i would love to talk to Tubi about doing a limited series for postal yep fuck yeah that right. sounds awesome yep it sounds awesome um uh, there should be a postal multiverse yep well i, I mean i'm 53 for christ's sake you know well, that was that was actually another question we had on the list. You're a uh, pretty ageless, bro. Like, what's your secret? Um, there's a bobby pin on the back of my head that just sucks all <laughs> pulls the all the skin back. <laughs> you have a little clip. Don't turn around. We don't want to see it. We don't do not break the illusion. Uh, and also, you said the multiverse. So, I mean, there's all these openings now in, in all these uh, cinematic universes. Like, do you want to play a superhero or a villain or something in one of these? Like, is that something that interests you at all? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be in Black Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also, I mean, we were talking about, you know, Christmas Story took 10 years, and forgetting how poorly uh, Black Adam was recepted and everything that's happened, that's actually something that The Rock's been working on for, like, 12 years, so. Yeah. yeah. But, I, you know, I think the problem was also, like, and I haven't seen Black Adam yet. Neither but have I. I haven't seen Thor, Blood, uh, Love, and Thunder yet, but I... And I don't really care. The thing is, I don't really care to. And I loved phase one of Marvel. I loved the first Iron Man. Uh, I, I really enjoyed Captain America. I loved the the Winter Soldier. I loved the Avengers Endgame. Um, yeah. When it got to the end of Avengers Endgame, I'm like, perfect. I got it. I'm yeah. happy. Beautiful. And then the other ones came out. I'm like, I don't have any fucks to give. Mm -mm. This is stupid. It's badly done. It's cheesy. It looks like a movie of the week. And especially like Sean Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. I'm sorry. I know you're not supposed to give it any critique because it has Asian people in it, but I'm sorry. You again, another one of those moments where somebody magically learns how to use look how to use a tool or or a weapon. <laughs> that they've never touched before. Yeah. And then it's glowing beams of light. I'm like, well, it was better than Eternals. Eternals was real dull. Yeah. That was, yeah. and then the problem ends up becoming also this, like, and I had this problem. 
so there's there's okay captain america is fighting in civil war he's uh he's holding a helicopter remember that shot he's yeah yeah helicopter. on the helipad yeah yeah and he's and he's struggling with the helicopter now i don't know i'm sure you guys can look it up how many pounds of force that a helicopter can put i'm sure it's very impressive it's got to be tens of thousands of pounds yeah. so now he's doing that he's like yeah okay so we established that right then we established that thanos beats the fuck out of the hulk like this like a yeah. bitch. like me going up to an eight-year-old kid bap bap just scott fark is that guy right done <laughs> <laughs> then then captain america stops thanos from snapping his fingers so what <laughs> what is the what is the because here's the problem i'm a human being mike's a human being if mike and i fight a bear we know that we're gonna die yeah and if we go into fighting a bear and survive or, or, or even attempt it there's a level of heroism because we're doing it to save the person we love or whatever but we know the risks there's real risks i don't you know, get my arm ripped off and magically grow a new one back because reason. Yeah. And if I did, then there are no stakes. And if there are no stakes, then I don't give a shit. No. And if yeah, I don't yeah. give a shit because there's no danger, then why am I watching this? Because yeah. it's shiny. And that's that was my problem with the new this new Star Wars, uh, all this stuff that is dumbed down to a level where you can have toddlers watch it. Have you watched you know, Andor though? That's a whole. I, I, I haven't watched it. I heard it's oh great. Oh it my great. fucking god! I heard it is amazing yeah. and actually it supports my point. Exactly like, your point. Yeah. When, when you you know, let's go back to Star Wars: A New Hope. Yeah. You meet you. You have your opening. You have the, you see the planet blown up, which you care and you don't care because you yeah. don't know anybody on the planet. No. Yeah, and yeah. And it's too big to really relate to. You know, right. it's like when you watch people get shot in a movie. I've never been shot in real life. So you go, oh, that looks like a bad thing. Right. But sad, if, sad. I showed you, if I showed you uh, me getting a paper cut. Yeah, I'm really good. Or if I went to go lick an envelope and it cut open the sides of my mouth. Like, just uh, talking about it. Just talking about it. And then I squeeze some lemon juice on <laughs> yeah. it. Right. Small because things. everybody has that experience. So you know what it feels like. So in Star Wars, the first one, you meet Luke Skywalker. He's kind of a whiny, whiny kid. He's complaining, but there's his aunt and his uncle. And then he goes into town and the aunt and uncle are nice people. They're like, ah, oh, well, he'll learn the, he'll learn about this. Should we tell him about this? No, don't talk about that. <laughs> they're people. You care. Right. They're being nice. Right. And then he comes back and they're dead and they're not just fucking dead. Charred. To death. Yeah. Charred meat on the bones of a skeleton. And he is yeah. struck in the chest. Now cut to the new one, A Force Awakens. Who the fuck are these people in a tent with a droid? I don't give a shit about them. Everybody in the background, I don't know who they are. Stormtroopers get off a ship and fire laser beams at extras in the background who fall down. I don't care. Right. There's nothing there for me to give a crap about. I've never been shot with a laser beam. I mean a flashlight. And I don't know who these jackasses are. And now all the rules don't apply because emo Darth Maul can stop flashlight be like fuck off <laughs> just, it's all designed for parents who are helicopter parents to feel comfortable putting a toddler in front of a show to babysit them so that kid can want to buy all the different toys and mommy and daddy can go drink their wine yeah. it's just there's well that's no that's why you need to watch andor it's not made for kids it doesn't hold your hand it's fucking sad it's dark yeah. it's violent and I mean, really, I don't know if you watch Rogue One. It's on another fucking planet. Like really? it, it, it really, it's almost not a Star Wars project. There's Empire logos. There's a few characters you may know from things really offbeat characters. But for the most part, it could be any project. And it is fucking phenomenal. It's a spy thriller. It's a prison break. It's a heist movie all in one season. And it I, is I fucking phenomenal. I don't have Disney phenomenal. Plus because I don't need it, but I'll check it out. And it is see, worth like one month of Disney Plus. I pro I will pay you that, for that month. That's what I liked about uh, a Christmas story. Christmas is that to me the it's not really for kids. No, the original Christmas story is for kids and yeah. parents. The new movie 
it's not really for kids. Kids can't relate to parents' no. problems. They really no. can't. If you're under the age of 25 or 30, you're not going to give a shit about a Christmas no. story. Well, well also the, the kids that the kids that saw the original, they grew up now to be adults. Well, that's so. it. And they, and they have kids. This movie is for them. Right. It's meant for the people that watched the movie as a kid. It's not meant. I mean, it, it's exactly. flipped. The original movie was exactly. kids with a few little adult stories. This is mostly adult stories with a few little kid stories. Yeah. And it's meant for those. It's that stage in their life because yeah. now we are, are matching their life development. And these stories that they're telling, like the first movie is a coming of age story. And this uh, Christmas story, Christmas, is another coming of age story where he steps into the shoes of his father. Right. Yeah. And becomes a man that he was always afraid to be. And those are the things that we will all go through. Everybody here. Uh, everybody watching this, everybody on this was born, was a child, grew up, uh, will have a family of some kind yep. or another, whether they're just people they love. I don't have children myself, whether they have children, whatever it is, there will be steps when they, when they watch their parents die and this is your life. And eventually this is what happens to you. No matter what you do in a hundred years, everybody watching this will be dead. So yep. this is your life. You better fucking be part of it and enjoy it. And this movie is aimed at that audience and really connects with them really really well so anyways yeah. next question what, what do we got well i was gonna finish the 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 superhero villain thing with i actually think you would fit really well into what james gunn has done with the dc yeah. universe uh, like his stuff is the reboot is, yeah the reboot yeah. stuff is really funny and gritty and violent like if, if you yeah. haven't seen peacemaker or or the I or, oh, right so peacemaker good peacemaker and, really and the new yeah. suicide squad movie like that shit yeah. is yeah fucking stellar and i'm glad that's where he wants to take the dcu because the dcu has sucked balls well if james yeah, gunn is a huge fan of postal huge and the postal web yeah. uh, podcast i'll let him know right here i am open and available hire this fucking guy in the DC universe, i so. think we should have everybody reach out to get zach a spot somewhere in there because james gunn did sort yeah. of get postal canceled not by us but you know he was involved with uh trauma and they you know he got canceled from from marvel a few years ago because of yeah. shit he said with trauma 15 years ago and, and then, then they're like oh he was making us a lot of money we need him back and right yeah back I mean, he made there. some he made some dead baby jokes on twitter Back in the trauma yeah. days, and that got him canceled. And then DC's like, "We'll take him." That's hilarious. Let's so, get yeah. hash, hashtag Zach Ward trending right now. Yeah, hashtag Everybody Zach the Ward for DCEU or DCU, whatever they're calling it. I don't even fucking know these days. Um, you know, we're kind of I think, bordering. I think it should be. I think it should be the DC Gunniverse. Gunniverse. That's a good one. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I just came up with. I that. like it. I like it. Yeah, that should trend too. Zach Ward for DC Gunniverse. There it is. There's the hashtag. Um, you know, we are we are pushing up uh, on over an hour here. I didn't want to keep you much longer than that. I know we didn't ask a ton of questions, but that's because you wax intellectual for for a good long periods of time. Um, what's next you for you? Been, what's next? Um, what's next for me is I'm doing a couple of projects that I'm just acting in, which is nice. So I guess that uh, focus on acting and cut off my producer, director, writer brain. Um, I'm doing that in in right after Christmas and in January, and I'm uh, completely almost done with my movie Patsy Lee. And then, like I said, we're hoping to do the uh, birthday premiere for James Hong, turning 94 in February. There's the goal. Uh, so that's a lot. I've been working towards that goal for quite a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. And send me an invite. Excited. I'll fly out for that shit. Sweet. Just, You're I'm definitely not... the person I want to have there. When I <laughs> yeah. think of. The people I need. To if have. you need somebody to fill a seat, I'll <laughs> fill a seat for you, bro. I will wear any face mask. I don't give a fuck. Awesome. You know what? Uh, maybe that'll happen. That'll be yeah, great. No, no. Don't worry about it. Do what you got to do. Else? But, uh, you know, I love this shit. So. What else do I have got going on? What other questions can I ask me questions? I'll answer them real quick. And uh, you're Canadian. Do you like Letterkenny or Shorzy? Do you watch those shows? I love Letter Kenny. I've never seen Shorzy. Thank you for telling me about it. I'll check it out. But yeah, it's I a spin-off. It's a spin-off show from Letter Kenny about the character okay. that nobody gave a shit about, but it's actually a better show. It's much better, actually. Yeah. You should it's try all about it. it's really a hockey show it. and it's fucking phenomenal. Uh Pedro wanted to know what's the difference between a duck. I literally hate that line. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't kill me. 
No, because no, no, I know no. I know a bunch of people would ask you that question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I hate that scene because it's shot so badly. But uh, yeah. what's the difference between a duck? Depends on the duck. What kind of duck are you asking? Is it for a mallard, green-throated mallard? Or are we talking more of the Lithuanian brown-footed speckled uh, warbler? Yeah, that is a good that's question. One. What? Yeah, that's a good that's return one. question. What kind of duck? Uh, how was working with Michael Bay? Um. He's technically a genius and uh, deserves a lot of respect for that. Um, social skills, not so friendly, but on the flip side, why should he? He's one of those guys that if you don't matter to the film, he doesn't give a fuck about you because he's busy with too many things. And, uh, you know, he's on the top of the totem pole as it goes. Um, I got to do a $150 million movie with him. I can't hate on the guy. He gave me a great opportunity to do something with giant robots. Uh, and you got to super- die first. You got to die first. Yes, I did. Yes, sir. <laughs> That's the key. Uh, let's see. What's next? How does it feel to be the biggest star that came out of A Christmas Story? Well, considering that Peter Billingsley produced Iron Man. <laughs> but people don't remember producers. They remember No, they don't. Uh, I mean, the biggest star that came out of A Christmas Story. Yeah. Um, uh, that's very sweet. Thank you very much. I I don't think of myself that way. I think we're biased myself, because you were the postal dude. But so but I, I think of myself as a journeyman actor who's just uh, loves what he gets to do what I love for a living, and that all, hasn't always been the truth. There are many years of of horrible struggle and and lots of difficulty. Same, bro. Um, we're indie game developers. We fucking get it. Yeah, you do. And it's just you know, it's always funny when someone's asking for your autograph and you go and you're. Uh, you're um doing construction yeah no that's that's... a real thing baby that's a real thing trust me uh we're a smaller scale here but i used to uh, bounce at bars a lot just because i like doing it and uh, yeah the money didn't hurt and sometimes i'd be talking to someone and then they'd find out that i made postal and they're like what the fuck are you doing here i'm like because i need to pay rent or get the fuck out of the house or you know like so it's great to be uh, it's great to be uh, an actor that people like my work. So I'm very grateful that I have that opportunity. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, if you had to pick one thing in the industry to do, what would that be for the rest of your life? One thing. Directing. You like directing. Yeah, if I had to pick one. Yep. If I, because that's acting is hard. Yep. To sell this all the time, not everybody wants this. <laughs> The you thing. can do directing without having to worry about your face for the rest of your you fucking can do life. Directing, as long as you're mentally there and you can move around and you're up to speed, you can look like a bag of potatoes. Doesn't matter. Yep. So yeah, direct. It would be directing. And uh, who do you want to work with? Wow, I've never been asked that question. Like, who's your like? I mean, the dream is, you know, who is your dream? I'd love to work with Christopher Nolan. Yep. Love to work oh, yeah. with. Steven Spielberg, again, I did an episode of a TV show with him years ago, High Incident. He was very cool. Nice. Um, gosh, well, I've worked with, uh, I like to work with James Cameron. I've worked with Cameron Crowe, um, worked with Michael Bay. Who else? I don't know. Oh, I'd, like to, I'd love to work with Guy Ritchie. Damn. That guy's a baller, dude. Yeah. Love Guy Ritchie stuff. I actually watched uh, Bullet Train the other night, and it reminded me a lot of Guy Ritchie stuff. Very much. Yeah. Very much. I was very inspired by that shit. And my wife, who has a very short ADD attention span, she was like, she's like, are we watching a fucking Guy Ritchie movie? And she fell asleep because <laughs> she can't focus on the movie because it's constantly calling back shit that she doesn't remember. So, uh, well, that's cool. Yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of big names, and and I hope you do fucking work with those people because you know. No, that would be sick. Yeah. Yeah, you deserve it, man. Um, and a lot of fans were asking, you play any video games? I haven't had the time to. Same. Uh, honestly. And, and um, my favorite video game of all time, Portal. Well, oh, I replayed the, the Portal recently, the, the new ray tracing update they did. It was, it was sick. Yeah, replaying yeah, Portal that game. Is... That game is... Legendary, well, frame yeah. rates, but it's pretty good. They uh, they sort they didn't remake the game. They redid some of the graphics to use uh, some of the yeah. latest technologies. It's oh, called ray tracing. Yeah, they put ray tracing, yeah, in the game. So oh, ray looks... tracing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's yeah. awesome. I just uh, portal to me is just I I like going to bed and dreaming 
in that portal environment. Yep. So you know how you can start making your world and then yep. you keep going like, oh, I was upside down. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, talking about that, uh, they said recently they started writing the script for Portal Three. Uh, some of the people at Valve. So yeah. So I, don't I, plan I, yeah. on that ever coming out. They've never released a third game yeah, in yeah, anything. Yeah. Literally, yeah. it is a meme. <laughs> yeah. Valve does not I, release I, I a third the game. Woman who did and the neither did we. <laughs> Yeah. I met the woman who, the, uh, who did the voice of Gladys. Oh, nice. At a convention one time. I, and I totally fanboyed. <laughs> it was so cool. Oh. Uh, Portal is one of those things that anytime uh, the game Postal gets talked about on Reddit, um, somebody comes in and they're like, oh, I thought this said Portal. <laughs> well, actually, on Steam, if you type uh, Postal, uh, they are like, oh, other games are similar that you would like to play. And it says Portal. Yeah. But the two yeah. games are so different. And there's yeah. two, there's two there's two similarities. One, the word is obviously one letter apart. Number two, the portal logo is just like that. Yep, uh, yeah. that is true. Yeah, is and true. Uh, we know for a fact, Gabe, the guy that ran runs Valve, he's had a running with scissors sign on his wall for twenty plus years. So oh, that's cool. who knows if he was just like, what should the portal logo look like? And he was just looking at his wall, and he's like, how about that? And we're like, cool, we'll just fuck ourselves. Um, <laughs> don't be bitter don't I'm be not, bitter I'm not, the only You're reason not. we are here today the only reason running with scissors exists at all is because of valve and their kindness of putting our nonsense on steam back in 2012 that's literally the only reason we're still in business so they can make all the money in the world i don't give a fuck if they steal all of our ideas they can have them because we are only in business because of steam for better or for worse so um uh, what else can I answer? Um, I'm at the I... end of my list, and the questions that are just getting fucking buried up here. Uh, I do have some fans that are saying, uh, will you say hi to the Polish postal fan community? We do have a pretty large community in, in Poland, so they just wanted you to uh, say hi specifically to them. So this is Zach Ward, the postal dude, reaching out to the postal community in Poland. Thank you for your support. Continue playing. Continue having fun. And remember, go postal for regrets. <laughs> See, now you can say that. Uh, here's a question from a kitsch. Can you ask Zach how movies have changed when they transitioned from analog to digital? Uh, well, the, okay, Quentin Tarantino said it very well. In uh, analog, you're not actually seeing a moving image. You're actually seeing 24 frames, small pictures. And there, so there is an illusion of movement. Um, and that's part of the process and also, um, the way you color a film and, and, uh, what happens with celluloid, the chemical process, there is a little bit of unknown magic to it in the sense that you can never completely control it 100%. So you get some of the impurities, some of the um, quote mistakes actually lend a quality of value, the style of chemicals that are used, uh, the, the type of chemicals. So there's like how a, a painter uses their brushes and what type of paints they have access to. You go back to Egyptian times and like the color blue was very, 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 very hard to come by. Um, and so it was very expensive. And so it was reserved for certain people. So color palettes throughout history had a, had a value uh, based upon how easy it was to get them and what you had to make them from. So same thing with 35 millimeter and 16 mil and eight millimeter and the, and the development process, it was far more arduous and now, uh, and also more artistic in some ways. And now with digital, um, there's a lot more people who have access to equipment that can make movies. Doesn't mean it's any good. Um, doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, but it's like the old saying of the seven wise men touching an elephant. Everybody's going to see a different thing. Um, it does put the responsibility on the shoulders of the filmmaker to make something good. And as we've witnessed with uh, movies like Black Adam, um, you cannot just run visual effects and expect that people will be impressed anymore. You know, I did Christmas Story in 1982, came out in 83. And there are no special effects in that film. No. And um, but the story is watched almost forty years later. Why? 
because it's connecting to the audience because the audience are people. Uh, when I did Transformers, it was the first time you ever saw anything like that. Mm-hmm. Nobody's watching a 24 hour marathon of Transformers. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a fact. Yeah. And I'm not saying anything against the movie. It made over a billion dollars. It did very well. Nobody gives a shit because if it's just about what's the new shiny fantastical, there's always a new shiny fantastical. And now if anything's possible, then nothing's interesting. And then you start making it simpler Yep. and you connect to human beings and yep. that's two blocks in the film. So, you know, that's a long, there's a lot of questions to answer. Yeah. There's a lot of answers to that simple question. And it's not a simple question. Hopefully that starts you down a path of psychosis. Yeah. So enjoy. And I know we've, <laughs> I've already harped on this yeah. multiple times to you, but what you just said all about the, the way people connect and, and, <clears throat> and special effects sort of ruining things sometimes. That's why that newest star Wars show is phenomenal. There's special effects. There's just not that much of it. Or you look at like uh, Mad Max Fury Road. There's a ton of special effects, yeah. but you can't. You know. No, and right. Yeah. But there's right. also that's a ton cool. of practical effects too. Like, yeah. That's okay. what I love Nolan for that. Like the what Nolan does. Sometimes it's like invisible effects. You you don't notice them, but he does a lot of like practical stuff. Yeah. Or oh, Fincher, Fincher also. The yeah. spinning rooms. Yeah. Well, the spinning Fincher rooms. would do like when he did when he did Safe Room, and he's doing all of these unmotivated camera moves uh passing through like the objects and like stuff like that yeah like a uh, fight club also yeah yeah and that's kind of stupid but you can see how a director is playing with what's an option to him then and learn yeah. and, like that's, as a director you're always trying to figure out what the technology is how to utilize it if it works maybe it does maybe it doesn't and you're i mean I, look fincher is a god i would love to work with a guy um but yeah, you like you're always using technology to express your vision, quote unquote. Um, and sometimes you look at it and go, eh, man, that wasn't the best. But you got to try that, otherwise yeah. nobody knows. Um, but yeah, you look at a film like Mad Max: Fury Road, and there's so much VFX in that that blends the practical into it. Yeah, people people are saying, oh, this movie, it's all practical. I'm like, you're you're an idiot. There is. Well, it's not all practical, yeah. but it's a good yeah. movie outside yeah. of the VFX. That's the difference. Well, but it's, it's like you look at uh, you look at um... the thing. For example, the thing was practical. Oh, in the thing, the 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 first one from 1982. Of course, it was practical. The, from yes. uh, John yeah, Carpenter. I was gonna yeah. say you look at a film like Forrest Gump, and you see uh, Lieutenant Dan on the side of the oh boat, yeah, and his legs are chopped off, and that you that is. That's all VFX because they have a yep. motion control camera there that was the size of a car, <laughs> and then they can track it perfectly over and over, and they can take it out. And they had to work around that. A bunch of scenes, like when he's in the apartment, some of the uh, the props, the furniture is actually CGI, so that he can yep. swing his legs through it, and you wouldn't be able to tell. Right. But that type of forethought, it never took you out of the movie because all you had to accept is that. Lieutenant Dan has no legs. Yep. So yep. It's, when it's done that beautifully, then it's still following the same number one rule, which is connect to the emotional level of the audience to convey a story as opposed to fuck story. And here's shiny video game. Who gives a shit? Right. And yeah. That was, exactly. you know, that's interesting for about 30 seconds and then click. Like, well, I saw that uh, Nolan in his next movie, uh, next year, Oppenheimer, uh, he went to his... Uh, uh, special effects supervisor is like, can we make the nuclear bomb practical? And the guy was like, uh, <laughs> how it's gonna be difficult. <laughs> He's yeah. like, how practical can we make it? <laughs> right, like you gotta go uh, contract with Kim Jong Un that you can go film in <laughs> one of his test sites. That's that's right, probably yeah. the only way you're getting practical. That nuke is so effects. awesome. That's a movie in itself. That's <laughs> yeah. a movie in itself. Exactly. Uh, um, but yeah. for example, stuff stuff like uh, the the thing from 1982 and the the prequel yeah. from 2011, the, the it looks so much better with the prosthetics and makeup in the original than the the CGI one, like in this in the the prequel after. So yeah, you should. Uh, Corridor Digital actually did a thing on the sequel to. Uh, oh, I I love their channel. I watch it all the time. Yeah, they yeah. did one on the sequel uh, to uh, the thing and how, what what actually happened in post when the problems that they had and how they they literally had a bunch of uh, practical effects on set for and the switch it at the end. Yeah, I think they had to take them all out and rebuild them and like just bad 
planning and and that's the thing is like i don't know if you guys knew this but there's so many people at the studio level who have no idea how the sausage gets made and they mm-hmm. and they'll be like i've been reading about vfx what we do with those and you're like that's not needed here at all you're like yeah but i saw it and people like that and literally you're being given advice how to build things from people who have no comprehension how any of it goes together yeah they just heard something or read something in variety and it's a buzzword and it's infuriating yep. and i feel yeah. for them because they don't know how dumb they are and they're not willing to learn like i i'm very aware that i am not as smart as i would like to be and so whenever i'm around people who know shit that i don't i'm asking every question i can so i can you know get a little smarter but they are convinced they are at very smart and they know everything and then they just make fucking horrible decisions yep. yeah but i think sometimes people don't realize like games or movies or the, the fact that they happen there's so many like cogs in the wheel like things that have to come together it's kind of a miracle in itself that that movie is like as good as it is sometimes when you have so many people working on it for like years or well months. that's and for yeah. us and, uh, for us that's yeah. like everybody compares everything to grand theft auto and right exactly they are yeah. the sensible. literal yeah. They, they are a one-off because they have unlimited funds and they spend unlimited amount of time breaking employees' yeah. backs to make something unattainable by everybody else. I mean, really, yeah, it's yeah. not. You, you can't get there. So we get unfairly compared to them. And I'm like, guys, I'm not kidding. Our entire budget was like maybe a week of Grand Theft Auto. They can go on yeah. Xbox yeah. and yeah. weekends. Right. And we get banned from Xbox and they don't. You know, it's just like th- there's it, it, with everything, right? Like. That's just the way it is, right? Like, yeah, fuck us, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> always. I live there, buddy. Yeah, yeah always exactly. There. Yeah, but that is uh, that is that is our life. We are now. But we're we actually we keep trying. Yeah. We do keep trying. So. But Postal Four is coming to PlayStation Four and Five <clears throat> in the first quarter of next year. So, um, yeah. it will be on PlayStation soon. All right, we got three minutes left because I gotta go. Give me your final questions. Let's wrap it up, and I'm out. Hey, Zach, who's better, Scott, Chris Owen or Zach Ward? What? I don't know. Somebody asked that. <laughs> Some Russian asked that in the chat. Uh, no idea who Chris Owen is. I wish him the best, but it's always <laughs> going to be Zach Ward is Scott Farkas. The- Zach Ward yeah. is the only Scott Farkas. Yeah, yeah. You, there's one no, and only. One and only, yeah. Um, over four decades. Yeah. Bitches. And he's still playing him today. I, I just will not watch it. a reboot, by the way. I will not watch a reboot without Zach Ward. <laughs> so it's not it's not going to be made. Yeah. No. At Fuck least that. for me, it's not going to be. Um how ma- we talked about this pre pre-show, but how many people have Zach Ward tattoos? I've seen at least seven. Um, and I've seen about 20 Scott Farkas tattoos. Are you honored or are you like I'm honored. I'm honored. It's 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 awesome. It's amazing. It's not a decision that I would make on my body, um, but I'm also not a huge fanboy. Oh, I am a fanboy, but I don't I don't take selfies with actors I, I work with. I don't. I just and that's it, you know. Right. Um, so if that's how someone wants, if I've affected their life in such a way that they're inspired to do that, uh, I'm very grateful that something I did didn't <laughs> was good. And so, thank you very much. I think it's lovely. Uh, last question that's been pounded in the chat, and I've avoided it till the end. Did you watch the World Cup final? No. <laughs> yeah. I don't give a shit about soccer. He's Canadian. Basketball, basketball baseball, hockey, high lie. All uh, sports. Horse, horse running. All sports. Hug running, uh, lacrosse, <laughs> uh, golf, <laughs> tennis, um, uh, ultimate frisbee, uh the trout channel basketball. but you do care about uh beer pong it's weird just the nope. one sport <laughs> um you shook me at hockey you're canadian <laughs> we're not all the same you racist prick what the yeah hell is what the fuck you portuguese <laughs> piece of shit well uh, you can say i like football, there is a so. fan that asked how did you end up in postal four they, it's pretty simple i texted him and i said hey do you want to reply to your role as the dude in postal four and he was like a uh, fuck yeah and that's that and people oh, love it. Legendary yeah. story right there, my friend. It's very. Actually, here's how it went down. I got into my car, <laughs> and I drove to L.A., and then I ambushed him at a bar. 
<laughs> uh, no, uh, me and Zach talk not that often, but we talk. And, uh, you know, we saw people that were actually asking for it. And we were like, fuck it. This is a great idea. Let's do this. Why not? Why yeah. not? Yeah, we had him play himself in Paradise Lost, and that popped the fuck off. Mm-hmm. So we said, let's see if he wants to play the dude again, because we've been trying to get him to play the dude for the last 10 fucking years. And it's going to happen for real, though. Yeah, it's going to happen. There is no timetable on this. Uh, good things take time. So uh, Zach Ward will return as the postal dude at some point. Oh, I will. You bet you. Yeah, it'll happen in the 2020s. How about that? And yeah. Now he's loaded with experience. Yeah. <laughs> Now that Scott Farkas uh, came back to life, postal dude Zach Ward is is in is in the is in the pipe. Uh, I think that's it, man. I think we got we got plenty of plenty of good questions answered. I think our fans are uh, very happy to have had awesome. you on here. Awesome. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for answering the questions. Thanks for your insight into the industry. You know, we're just fucking idiotic game developers here with a shitty podcast and a shitty game, and we love to hear about. Uh, what happens on the other side? Because uh, you know, me and Vince's, me and Vince's movie knowledge was the four days I was on set. <laughs> yeah, I think I can beat that. So yeah, you have a little bit more than that. So uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming on. And uh, if you have anything you want to say to the fans before we peace out, that'd yes. be awesome. Uh, if you want to support Alzheimer's, go to alzheimersassociation.org. dot um, org. For the rest of you who are st- anybody knows someone who's going through dementia or Alzheimer's, please contact them. They've got chapters all over the country. It's free, and they can give you a lot of support and help people out. Uh, outside of that, um, have a great Christmas. Have a great Hanukkah. Have a wonderful holiday season. Be kind to each other. Love the people that you love because you know they're not going to be here that long. And enjoy your lives and and try to be the person that you'd be proud of in the future. Agreed. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Pedro. Thanks, Thanks Matt. And thanks for everybody for tuning in. We'll catch you in a couple weeks. See you later.